Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of The Inner Landscape, three science fiction novellas of the grotesque, the unpredictable, the impossible, by Mervyn Peake, J.G. Ballard, and Brian W. Aldiss. Dane reads. I will say, going straight in, they're only just novellas. They're kind of just straddling the line between novellas and short stories, especially like the shorter ones in here. Uh, I've only read Ballard before, and I'm, I consider myself a Ballard fan. I've heard of Peak and Aldous, so it was nice to read those for the first time. I'm gonna read you the blurb here on the back, then I'm gonna go through and check out some of my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, boy in darkness, the voices of time, danger, religion. Three authors have created three worlds, weird, eerie, bizarre worlds, landscapes of mists and strangeness and alien shapes. And in worlds of strange landscapes, man himself becomes strange, unpredictable and capable of new powers, of exploration into the mind, into the world of the inner landscape. So this has got some characters in it like capitalized proper noun of a boy, goat and hyena. And hyena is great. I will show you why in a minute. I thought this was uh, really nicely written and, uh, you know, relatable. There is a kind of laughter that sickens the soul. Laughter when it is out of control. When it screams and stamps its feet and sets the belly jangling in the next town. Laughter in all its ignorance and its cruelty. Laughter with the seed of Satan in it. It tramples upon shrines, the belly roarer. It roars, it yells, it is delirious. And yet it is as cold as ice. It has no humour. It is naked noise and naked malice. And such was hyenas. So this is why I love the hyena. So uh, I'll just read you this little, this little passage. Oh, but it's shameful. It was I who found him, found him alone in the white dust. And it was I who crept up to him and surprised him. It was all my doing and now I must share it. Oh, hyena, hyena, you are more brutal than I and you must have your way. And so I shall, never fear, said the hyena, cracking a fresh bone between his teeth and spitting out a cloud of white powder. But oh, it's the glory that I need, said the goat. It's the glory of it. Ah, said Hyena, you are lucky that I let you come at all, you knobhead. And he keeps calling the goat a knobhead throughout. So for example, here we have, the head of the hyena turned not to the boy, but to the goat. Do as you're told, he cried, insolent dustbag, clod and filthy knobhead. Do what you're told before I crunch your skull. Hyena turned to the boy. He's as dense as a nag's heel. Look at him now. And it's kind of, it feels almost like, not biblical, but like, fa fablical. It feels like a fable, you know? except with more knobheads. And then again, I just think, I think this is probably a good uh, paragraph to kind of capture why I think it, it reads like a fable. The breast of the lamb was like a little sea, a little sea of curls, of clustering curls, or like the soft white crests of moonlight verdure, verdure white as death, frozen to the eye, but voluptuously soft to the touch, and lethal also, for to plunge the hand into that breast would be to find there was no substance there, but only the curls of the lamb, no ribs, no organs, only the yielding horrible mollients of endless wool. So we all know that I am a fan of spotting ejaculations in books, and we have one here. From the very first, when he had been accosted by the goat, he had, bit by bit, been able to piece together a foul, fantastic and unholy picture. A peculiar horror seeped through the heinous place, but this he now knew to be mere background to a nameless crime. The scattered sentences, the word here, the ejaculation there, had made it all to had made it all to clear that he was to be sacrificed. It should be too clear, not to. Should have two O's can't believe I have to say that. This is interesting to me as a serial insomniac, so I believe, are we in Ballard's one at this point? I don't know because it doesn't have any, yeah we are. It just doesn't have any um, like title bits or anything. It's got page numbers, but it doesn't tell you on the pages what story you're in. But um, yeah, so we're into Ballard's effort here and we've got, here the tape have been cut and edited and Whitby's voice, less querulous this time, picked up again. Just, a, just as a matter of interest, tell me something. How long do you sleep each night? Powers says, I don't know exactly, about eight hours, I suppose. And then Whitby says, the proverbial eight hours. Ask anyone and they say automatically eight hours. As a matter of fact, you sleep about ten and a half hours like the majority of people. I've timed you on a number of occasions. I myself sleep eleven. Yet thirty years ago, people did indeed sleep eight hours, and a century before that, they slept six or seven. In Vasari's lives, one reads of Michelangelo sleeping for only four or five hours, painting all day at the age of 80 and then working through the night over his anatomy table with a candle strapped to his forehead. Now he's regarded as a prodigy, but it was unremarkable then. How do you think the ancients, from Plato to Shakespeare, Aristotle to Aquinas, were able to cram so much work into their lives? Simply because they had an extra six or seven hours every ever day, another typo. Of course, a second disadvantage under which we labor is a lowered basal metabolic rate, another factor no one will explain. So the gist of this story is the guy starts to spend more and more time asleep until he's just logging 
how much hour, how many hours he spent awake. Uh, woke 9.40 to sleep 4.15. June the 19th, eight and three quarter hours. That's how long he was awake. Anderson rang up this morning. I nearly put the phone down on him, but managed to go through the pretense of making the final arrangements. He congratulated me on my stoicism. Even used the word heroic. Don't feel it. Despair erodes everything. Courage, hope, self-discipline, all the better qualities. It's so damn difficult to sustain that impersonal attitude of passive acceptance implicit in the scientific tradition. I tried to think of Galileo before the Inquisition, Freud surmounting the endless pain of his jaw cancer surgery. And so here we get Danger Religion by Brian W. Aldiss, which is a great title, by the way. And so uh, here we get this little paragraph here. In this matrix of yours, I understand you pass through what is now referred to as the tobacco age, where many people, this applied particularly to the first half of the last century, were slaves to the tobacco habit. It was the age of the cigarette. Cigarettes were not the romantic objects portrayed by our historical novelists. They were killers, for the nicotine contained in them, though beneficial to the brain in small quantities, is death to the lungs when scattered over them in large quantities. However, before the cigarette finally went out of production towards the end of the 70s, how are you feeling, Mitra? It won't take long. Before the downfall of the cigarette firms, they developed nicomiotine because the firms were in general bad odour. This new drug lay neglected for 50 years. In this matrix of yours, it is neglected still as far as I can ascertain. And basically, it's like a new drug that people start to take. But I find that interesting as an ex-smoker. And it's true, nicotine is actually good for you. I, I was reading about it in uh, How Not To Die by Dr. Michael Greger, and he was like, small amounts of nicotine are good for you. The problem is, is that people normally get that by smoking and smoking is very bad. And then uh, we get a woman called Anne and he goes, why can't you speak, Anne? She closed her jaw and lifted up her chin. On the whiteness of her neck ran an ugly scar. They had severed her vocal cords. I clasped her thin shoulders and let anger burn over me. Is this done to all slaves? Shake of head. To some, to most of them, nod. Some sort of punishment, nod. Hurt you, nod. They're AVOXes. <laughs> so yeah, The Inner Landscape by Mervyn Peake, J.G. Ballard and Brian W. Aldiss. I think I enjoyed them probably in that order. Peake's story was cracking, Ballard's story was pretty good and Aldiss's story was kind of okay. Overall, I would give it probably a 3.5 out of 5, but it's worth checking out if you're interested in one or more of the authors, as I was. So there we have it. That's what I made of The Inner Landscape by Mervyn Peake, J.G. Ballard and Brian W. Aldiss. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book. If you read it, hit that like button. If you've enjoyed this video, hit that subscribe button for more. And I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.